from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Looking toward the future. I think we need to really discuss is the safety net the appropriate height off the ground, so to speak, uh, moving into this farm bill. Lawmakers discuss potential changes to crop insurance in the next farm bill, pushing the limits. We get in the red band stick bugs, we've only had that one year. That's absolutely makes you want to puke. How one farmer is going against the grain in order to beat pests at their own game. As high heat and drought conditions continue to force farmers to make difficult decisions. With some already calling this year's crops a lost cause. That's right now on Angle. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. After a couple of days of blistering heat, temperatures will be a few degrees cooler in the southern part of the country, but in some cases, the damage may have already been done to crops. Right now, USDA says 38% of the cotton crop is rated good to excellent. Last year at this time, that number was 60%. Now looking specifically at Texas, just 21% falls in the good to excellent category. And one look at the drought monitor, you can see why. 93% of the state is now in some form of drought, with more than half of the state in extreme drought. And most of Texas has only received between trace amounts of rain to upwards of three inches of precipitation. Lubbock County and surrounding areas in the state are known for being some of the top cotton producing areas in the country. And although cotton is a drought tolerant crop, Ag Day affiliate KCBD reports this year's heat and drought conditions have made it nearly impossible for dryland fiber to grow. They report many farmers in the area will be claiming insurance on their crops this year. We do have that on the farming side to fall back and on. Uh, there's still expenses that do not quit. They, they just keep going. You have your labor and your equipment expenses and all of that. You still have to keep the ground clean because uh, there will be a next year. The CEO of Plains Cotton Growers saying that low cotton production will cause farmers, gens, and communities to lose money. Economic conditions in the area, not just for production agriculture, but also infrastructure. Uh, so you have cotton gens, you have the warehouse, you have the merchandising community uh, that have a big impact on those underlying segments that domino into it. Um, so it's not just one, one segment that's going to be impacted by these growing conditions. Range and pasture conditions now rated 84% poor to very poor. And the Bermuda grass that's left in Northeast Texas is reportedly now being damaged by grasshoppers and maggots. But dry conditions aren't just confined to Texas. Crop conditions in Indiana dropped again this week with only 45% of the corn rated good to excellent. That's down 2% from last week. That is also down substantially from the 73% rating last year. However, the state is a patchwork of conditions in central Indiana, Justin Orm says he's had some timely rains, and like many in the state, so he's encouraged about the yield potential of his corn. I think that our corn's yield potential is still in that 250 bushel range here on our farm, and I think in certain areas of the county that's definitely true, but in our across the state as a whole, in those areas that it's still dry, the yield potential has really been drastically reduced. Orm is also encouraged about achieving average bean yields despite the low rated crop in Indiana, which is only at 46% good to excellent. That compares to 69% last year. So will Indiana and other areas in need of some rain be getting some soon? Meteorologist Matt Yurisavik joins us with more. Matt. Yeah, we need more rain in parts of the Corn Belt and unfortunately not going to see a whole lot as we head through the rest of this week, although the weekend does bring more chances for parts of the Corn Belt and Indiana as well. Uh, but we are going to be taking a look here at this root zone and you can see parts of northern Indiana, parts of Michigan, a lot of rain over the past uh, really couple of days and that has led to uh, some of that blue still on the map, but still very dry out west and getting drier and that's because this ridge is not going anywhere. This is the jet stream on Saturday, still extremely far to the north and that's creating temperatures in the 90s and triple digits all the way up into parts of the Dakotas, Iowa, all the way as far east as Richmond, Virginia and Wilmington, North Carolina. So it's not just the southwest and the center of the country, it's really the entire lower 48 dealing with this heat and humidity right now and that is going to continue not only this week but into parts of next week 
as well. And lots of kids at Grandma and Grandpa Camp right now. Gerilyn James Lee of Mount Olive, North Carolina, sharing this picture of Black Angus cattleman Kenneth Lee and his grandson, Kadir Ponder. Looks like Grandpa and Grandson are having a lot of fun working together this summer. I'll have more on your forecast coming up. Unspoken Truth About Pests on Ag Day brought to you by Duracade Viptera Trait Stacks, guarding against 16 above and below ground corn pests like mid-season threats of corn rootworm, earworm, and western bean cutworm. Comprehensive control when it matters most. The last year, Arkansas farmers were on the front lines of intense armyworm infestations. This year, the dry weather is causing problems with grasshoppers and blister beetles so what other problems are starting to pop up and how do planning dates play a role? Farm Journal sign Morgan digs into the details as she kicks off unspoken truth about pests. Matt Miles isn't afraid to push the production limits. We set aside a budget for research so we can take, take that portion of the money and say, okay, let's go chase something stupid and, you know, maybe blind hog finds an acre every now and then. And this year, Matt, along with his son Lane and agronomist Rob, decided to push the limits with planting dates, planting soybeans on February 17th. Earliness has made a bit, it's been a big deal with us on soybeans to dictate yield, but also it dictates on the, you know, amount of pests that we have to deal with during that, during that time. And as an agronomist, Deadman says this area battles pests every year and planting dates are a major way to fight those pests. We, we tend to want to plant as early as we can. We try to outrun them. Across the state, University of Arkansas entomologist Ben Thrash says one pest problem popping up for farmers is southwestern corn borer. If you've got non-BT corn and you're planting it, non-BT corn after non-BT corn year after year in the same area, yeah, that's that's where you start running into issues with your southwestern corn borer. You can have 100 completely lose a field of southwestern corn borer when they're really bad. And soybeans, it's the usual suspect starting to creep in, stink bugs. Those stink bugs, they're seed feeders. And so that's whenever you need to start being concerned about uh, some of these stink bugs. Green and brown stink bugs in soybeans are manageable, but it's a newer pest that's marched into Arkansas that has farmers on edge. We get in the red band stink bugs. We've only had that one year. That's absolutely makes you want to puke. I mean, you know, because you can't, you can't control them. They come back so fast. Thrash says red banded stink bugs are relentless feeders and studies show they reproduce more quickly than other stink bugs and are hard to control. It's severe, very, very severe yield loss from red banded stink bug. I mean, if you had them really, really bad years, I mean, I guarantee you could get 90% yield loss on some fields if they're really, really bad. Red banded stink bugs are a tropical pest that overwinter in southern Louisiana. But what we're going to have to watch out for is whenever Louisiana, whenever their beans start drying down, they start harvesting beans down south, that's going to be where we may have a push of red banded stink bugs. While pest pressure can be a problem here due to weather, not every one of these fields will see insecticide this year. You know, you try to minimize your risk. You know, the, the safest place for this crop to be is in, the, in that grain bin. And uh, the longer it stays out here, the, the more exposure we have and the more risk of damage that we have. All right, thanks, Ty. Now, corn futures, they've dipped below $6. Will the fall continue? We'll take a closer look next, coming up in markets. And later, the House Ag Committee meets to discuss the future of crop insurance. Details from the hearing after weather. Ag Day is brought to you by The End Zone by Farm Shop MFG, which allows you to rehydrate your soybeans from 10 to 13%. On a 20,000 bushel bin, that's an extra semi-load added to your bottom line. Order your End Zone fan control by July 31st and receive $200 off. The war in Ukraine is changing shipping patterns in the U.S. as more grain is leaving the Great Lakes bound for Europe and North Africa. The Great Lakes St. Lawrence Seaway saw June grain shipments surge year over year, up nearly 40% from late March to the end of June. Now, traders sent 414,000 metric tons of mostly corn and soybeans. Port officials say changing global trading patterns are due to the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. China bought some new crop soybeans on Wednesday, but the announcement didn't do much to move markets. Michelle Rook joins us with more. Joining us with market analysis, Brian Doherty with Total Farm Marketing. Uh, corn and soybeans under pressure again on Wednesday, Brian. And 
Are we really removing just weather premium or are the funds still nervous about this recessionary environment? Oh, it's a combination of the two. Uh, the recessionary environment, just the you know, sort of risk off, uh, the general economic malaise, shutdowns in China, all of these things are leaving uncertainty. And, and the bulls like at least something that's very perceptive. Shutting down China and worrying about exports and seeing slow exports yeah. is perceptively not one of these bullish mindsets. So it's a matter of money moving out of the market. It's a matter of realization that we had some timely rains this last week. We've got a good looking crop, got a lot of heat right now, but now we've got a little more rain in the forecast. Yeah, and that overrode uh, some export sales to China in the new crop category. But I think the bigger question is, you know, how much lower are we going to go in corn, especially, but even soybeans? Are we going to hold the July lows? Well, we're hopeful, uh, but I wouldn't necessarily plan it. Keep in mind, we, every day we start with a fresh price and the market has to move higher or lower based on what it perceives as friendly news or negative news or other outside influences, such as the price of crude oil, technical analysis, those type of things. So we're, we're hanging on and to, to kind of go back to what we talked about several weeks ago when we were much higher in corn, we said historically, this is about how much we take off. We had down to, you know, some target point would be about 575 in December. So we're holding that. But if the crop continues to mature, I still think there's downside risk down to 550 and then down to about $5 to 525, the lowest from last fall. So the pullback in corn, is that why livestock have held up in this recessionary environment? Because they've been holding in pretty well. Well, they've been holding pretty well. And we talked about this in the past that consumers have to get used to things. You have to get used to higher prices. You get a little more selective. But gas prices are coming down a little bit. The consumer has a little more confidence. I like the way the feeder market looks with, with cheaper corn compared to where it was three weeks ago, four weeks ago. I like the livestock market long term. Now it's just a matter of the consumer coming out with a vote of confidence and buys higher stakes. Sounds good. Thanks so much for joining us. Brian Doherty, Total Farm Marketing, our full analysis on agweb.com. More Ag Day is coming up. To discuss marketing strategies, call 800-334-9779. Ag Day is brought to you by MetLife Investment Management's Agricultural Finance Group. MetLife Investment Management is positioned to help you grow your business with a competitive farm, ranch, and agribusiness loan. To learn more, visit investments.metlife.com backslash agriculture. Meteorologist Matt Urasavik joining us here with, I guess, the bad news, <laughs> triple-digit temperatures across just a big part of the country here. Yeah, we've been talking about this for a while. That ridge is not going anywhere, which means a lot of these temperatures above 100 degrees are going to be sticking around, not only today, but really for parts of next week as well. And taking a look at these temperatures this afternoon, you can see 90s and triple digits across most of the center of the country, back into the southwest, but even up the east coast as well. Richmond to Wilmington, down to Jacksonville, and even Miami, seeing temperatures close to or just over 100 degrees. Right through the middle part of the country, a lot of heat and humidity here. It's been in the triple digits as we head through the last couple of days, and that's not going anywhere as we head into the end of this week. And then into next week as well and take a look at Phoenix 114 back there in the southwest and temperatures tomorrow morning will cool off a little bit but still in the 80s for some with all of that moisture in the air and back tomorrow right into the triple digits for most of those who saw that over the last couple of days so again this heat's not going anywhere here's a look at the southwest Yuma Phoenix above 110 degrees Las Vegas as well and then San Joaquin Valley right there. Fresno up to Sacramento seeing temperatures above 100 degrees. Even Grand Junction in Colorado seeing the same. And then if we come across the Gulf Coast, take a look at Memphis, Tennessee, 107 degrees. 101 there in New Orleans later this afternoon in Brownsville down in southern Texas, 107 there as well. A lot of humidity there across the Gulf Coast and up into the East Coast as well. Still seeing those pop-up showers and thunderstorms, but very, very hot out there. And this jet stream, you can see that big ridge right through the middle of the country. This is not going to change at all as we head through this weekend and in the next week. All of those kind of dips in the jet stream, which cool things off, staying well to the north. Just seeing potentially one coming in, bringing some more rain late next week. 
Chance for storms along a cold front there moving through the south and east. That's the only chance to cool some things off there in parts of the south. Otherwise, it's going to be hot and humid again. Just this front bringing those showers and storms across the south and east. Otherwise, we are going to be dry through most of the country, not only today, but heading into the weekend as well. And we'll continue to track those systems and the heat right here on Ag Day. That's a look around the country. Now let's take a look at the weather where you live. Knoxville, Tennessee, a few showers and thunderstorms, a high near 90 degrees. Tyler, Texas, hot and humid, a high near 98 degrees. And Lakeview, Oregon, sunny and hot, a high near 90 degrees. Got equipment to sell privately but tired of scams and hassles? Visit MachineRepeat.com and click Sell Mine. MachineRepeat.com, the simple and secure way to buy and sell equipment online. A New Mexico judge has ordered Tyson to pay millions of dollars in damages to a cattle producer over a contract dispute following a jury trial, ordering Tyson to pay $2.5 million in actual damages and another $8 million in punitive damages to Zia Agricultural Consulting. Now, Albuquerque-based Zia sued Tyson in May of 2020, alleging the packer breached a 2019 premium contract. Zia was to provide several thousand head of premium cattle for the Whole Foods Global Animal Partnership Certified Program. Tyson then buys, slaughters, and packs the cattle for the program, which are almost exclusively sold to Whole Foods. A complaint from Zia alleged when it began to deliver the cattle, Tyson refused to pay the agreed upon price, and Zia was limited on where else to sell those cattle. In court, Tyson denied breaching the contract. Now, House Ag Subcommittee held a farm bill hearing on Wednesday focused on crop insurance, and most farmers say it's the most important risk management tool they have available. Ag Day's Michelle Rook joins us with a look at the tweaks that may show up in the next farm bill. Clinton farmers testifying at the hearing say that after several black swan events, they and their lenders are more concerned than ever about how to protect their operations in these volatile markets. They suggested Congress needs to find a way to increase baseline funding to enhance the program, especially with the important role it plays in food security. Farmers told lawmakers the risk in agriculture is much greater than it was when the 2018 Farm Bill was written. Today they're facing 40-year high inflation and record high input costs, so they need greater levels of coverage and crop insurance, but it still has to be affordable. Okay. Uh, I think some, some premium discounts uh, always would be something we could look at um, and, and other things to make it a little more affordable. Um, uh, as I was saying earlier, I think uh, uh, crop insurance might be one of those things that some people are forced to uh, not participate in as, as margins get tighter. We just got to continue to uh, push forward and making sure that uh, the other politicians that don't appreciate crop insurance, that uh, we can convince them how important it is for the farmers because with our inputs right now, we have to have that safety net or that tool in order to uh, continue farming the next years. Committee members agreed that with the rising cost of farming and the increased geopolitical uncertainty, the safety net crop insurance provides may no longer be adequate. But when you double, quadruple um, input prices and that same producer is falling from 40 feet, I think we need to really discuss is the safety net the appropriate height off the ground, so to speak, uh, moving into this farm bill. I believe that in the next farm bill, one of the best investments this committee can make is further enhancements to the crop insurance system that provide producers affordable options to increase coverage. There was also consensus that spending for ad hoc disaster assistance is not sustainable for the future. Now, House Ag Ranking Member G.T. Thompson also urged lawmakers to reject attempts from those pushing the climate agenda to hijack the crop insurance program in the next farm bill. All right, thanks, Michelle. Coming up, soil testing with a twist. Why farmers are showing off their soiled undies in Delaware. Next. It may seem strange to those outside of farming, but farmers and researchers really do soil undies all in the name of science. The latest project was conducted by a group of farmers in Delaware who buried underwear near their crops in May to test the soil's health and reap the benefits. And the filthy, tattered remains that were dug up months later are a really good sign. The rapid decomposition of the 100% cotton undies means healthy soil. The Sussex Conservation District Soil Your Undies Challenge 
has actually been going on for years, encouraging farmers to use their briefs to track the fruits of their labor. The district is highlighting the innovative tidy whitey work at this month's State Fair. And that's a brief look at the day's news. From all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day. Out in farm day.